Uh, I'll be watching my Twitter account to see if I get fired between now and the end of my testimony. Uh, for the record, Lewis Porter, Commissioner of Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me here. I, I may be looking at a couple of things on my phone, so I, I'm not actually uh, tweeting. I'm just looking at some bills and uh, some, some notes. Um, the, the bill as it currently stands would, would uh, have an effect on the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department by uh, allowing those who've gone through our hunter safety courses, our hunter education courses, to um, be exempt from the age restriction which is uh, fine as far as it goes. Uh, I think you'll, you'll see on the uh, third page of the notes I just gave you, this graph which shows the number of uh, hunting, uh, hunting related shooting incidents uh, back to 1973. You can see a dramatic decline. Not all of that is attributable to mandatory hunter education, but I think a significant share of it is. Uh, the class works, the program works, and I'm proud to say that uh, nationwide, hunting is one of the safest activities that people engage in outside. In fact, if you look at the sheet that looks like this, you'll see that you're 25 times more likely to be injured uh, cheerleading than you are hunting, <laughs> which is, uh, I, think, I think, pretty great for, for an activity which, which uh, uh, involves tree stands, involves uh, firearms, involves bows with, uh, with uh, uh, razor blade broadheads. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trend and a trajectory we were very proud of and that I am very proud of my staff uh, and, and especially of the uh, more than 300 volunteer hunter education instructors who uh, work across Vermont. And uh, these folks uh, dedicate thousands and thousands of hours. Uh, they teach their classes in conjunction with a lot of rod and gun clubs around the state a lot of other associations and organizations, uh, and they are tremendously generous in, in what they do. On page 10 of our bill yep. from the House, um, the exemption for persons under 21 to buy firearms, they are a person to provide a seller a certificate of satisfactory completion of Vermont under safety course or equivalent under safety course for the approval all of these, all of these would have to be approved by your agency. Yes, and, and they and they are by and large now because we accept those certificates of completion from those courses for people who want to hunt in Vermont and get a Vermont license. You don't have to take a Vermont course if you want to hunt here, but you do have to have taken one that meets the International Hunter Education Association standards. And the province and other state or province of Canada, so Quebec. Yep, yep, and, and we do that now with hunter, with hunter safety. Do we, do, would, would Ontario be also eligible? Yes. Saskatchewan? Yep. Anywhere? Anywhere that does a course that, that we evaluate, and occasionally we have people come to us who wish to be licensed and have taken a course somewhere, and we, we research that course, make sure it meets the International Hunter Education Association standards, and then certify that that so course would be accepted. No, and I mean, I've, I've seen. I don't want to disparage any university, but I've heard that you can get medical degrees online. You know that you never took a course or anything, a degree from the University of Guatemala. You know. And that's one of several questions I have about how this section will work. Uh, you you put your finger right on it. If somebody shows up with an, what we call the orange card, a Vermont certificate of completion you know, the, the, the FFLs are gonna recognize and know that. If they show up with one from somewhere else, I'm not sure how they will know if we've certified that course or not. There's a second uh, area of this section of the bill which I'm not sure how it will work and which uh, I have uh, some concerns about, which Nobody is- Nobody in the House asked you? Uh, we, we testified in the House set and uh, gave sub substantially similar testimony over there. Um, the, the other piece is we may see a number of people going through our hunter education programs who aren't really interested in hunting. Uh, they're interested in using firearms for something else and they're gonna, gonna wanna go through our courses uh, in order to get their orange card and be eligible to be exempt. But if they have a New York card from the department of whatever it is from New York, that would be sufficient. 
Yes. If, if it was one of our approved Do you courses. Have proposed legislation that would fix your, would address your concerns? Well, what I don't have, I don't have a draft, but what I would propose is that we, uh, we also authorize other courses, NRA certified instructor led courses, 4 H courses, Boy Scout courses, to also provide for the exemption. Um, and there's a couple of different ways that we could do that. I, I, uh, I don't uh, particularly want to get in the business of having the Fish and Wildlife Department certify uh, other firearms courses, but if that's the way that you need to do it, well, we will we make it work. To do, uh, 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 the problem is that the House has passed this burden of the bill, <coughs> and many of us have significant issues with other sections of the bill, but I wanted to understand this, you know, the, the Senate, I voted against the bill when it left the Senate, just in case you didn't know. Um, but I was listening. The House made se significant changes to several sections, and this is one of the changes that originally when I asked Senator Ash, who proposed this amendment, uh, I said, well, why don't we provide an exemption for hunter safety courses? And he said, because I'm I wish you were here, but he said because we can't verify, you know, from other states, and so you've identified a problem. Um, so I don't know how to address that because this isn't like it's the first reading. I mean, this is a bill that's passed. It's going to either go to conference, be concurred with, or concurred with for the proposal amendment. But if we were to propose an amendment. Can you work with Eric to get something drafted in the next 24 hours? Certainly. And we could always put this off till next week, I guess, but, you know, if we need to. But it's important, if this is going to become law, I'm going to ask the governor to sign it, that we at least get it right. So if you're, as, I want to make sure I'm not, because yesterday somebody testified and then um, their boss said, no, that wasn't what it was. So I want to make sure you're, you're saying that the section, the section that a person provides with a certificate of satisfactory completion in another state or province is problematic. What I'm saying is that I want to make sure that we do that in a way that works, and I think we can draft something that will make sure that works. What I'd propose is that we come back to you with a draft that clears that up and also proposes an alternative mechanism for people to get certified if they aren't interested in learning hunter safety, if they just want to learn firearms courses. And would that, may I ask? Yeah, sure. Is it more, more reasonable to think that that would go through you, or would it go through somebody else to certify those um, people who aren't hunters but want to um, take uh, fire safety? I would think that it would be best to go through an NRA certified course or one of these other courses because, frankly, my who would certify them? Oh. I mean, who would who would say they're okay now? Would that be, come from you, or would that come, be registered with uh, law enforcement or with DMV, or who would? For, frankly, Senator, we don't have expertise in handguns, in defensive tactics, in competition shooting. Mm -hmm. But if, as a stopgap, you want to make me the person who convenes a group of people with that expertise, I will do that. I see. Well, I think we need an amendment by 4 11 30 tomorrow morning. Okay. If we're going to offer. Uh, unfortunately, my attorney is on, on a, on a well-deserved vacation this week, but I'm sure we'll figure something out. Well, here's our problem. We either have to, have to make it, we have to make one of three decisions today and then recommend to the Senate tomorrow unless the pro time get this bill right. We've come up, I'm sorry, I, the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife feels that the section on page 10 of your, um, of Eric's highlighted portion, mm -hmm. item number four is not um, something that he can support and would like to revise it. And there's some other issues that he would like to see. I, I think we can, I think we can provide you with something that will we'll straighten that up. So, um, is it your intention to vote on this tomorrow? It's on the action calendar tomorrow until it is. So, uh, which, just as, I, I, as I'm just walking in, it's on the new 
on a new document we're looking at. No, it's on, on the document we were from the page. Right here. Page 10. It's the certification from the uh, It's actually, okay. Senator, yeah, it, it, it is the concern that you expressed to me when you were first proposing the, the minor of the 821 provision. Right. That, you know, I said to you something about how to say, so how do you prove? And the House went and did this, and even though the well, commissioner yeah. testified, it looks like been something that was missing. Yeah, so at the time, I, at the time, as you know, I was drawing from the governor's memo who made the suggestion. But the suggestion in the governor's memo was I would, more general than this, and so it was hard to understand based on the governor's own recommendation whether it would be like a state certified or any private organization. And then knowing whether it was like an online checklist of two seconds, and then you get a thing versus something that might require some proven competence or knowledge of how to handle a firearm. So I think this is obviously more specific, which would have right. been, uh, uh, if we had had this in the governor's memo, it might have been in our original proposal. Yeah. So the, the uh, under, under, yeah. understood. Yeah. The point is the governor's yeah. memo yeah. by nature was more general, and that was harder to understand how you'd have a, yeah. a clear chain of command and a determination that it was a, yeah. a and, level of. And I think we can fairly easily apply the same methods that we apply to getting your hunting license to getting this orange card uh, or equivalent. The other question of the other courses, I think, is, is a little trickier, but I'll see what we can, what we can do. Senator Bennett, you described orange card, and I'm not familiar with that term. When you get done your hunter safety education course, you pass the test successfully, the instructor deems you're ready, you get a card, it's orange in color, it's your basic hunter ed. Uh, if certification. I'm, if I'm not interested in hunting, I'm interested in becoming an Olympic athlete and training in biathlon. What card is available for me to demonstrate that I'm in that process? Under this bill, none. Um, I would uh, I would propose accepting uh, NRA certified instructor led courses, 4-H courses, or Boy Scout courses, uh, and certificates of completion from those, uh, which could just be a letter from the instructor. As, a, as an alternative path for those folks who are interested in competition shooting but not hunting. Otherwise, you're gonna have students sitting through a class, only half of which is related to, to their interest. Can we make sure that that amendment includes people coming here from out of state who may not have participated in one of the programs you just defined? Well, that would be a, a policy decision for, for your committee. Um, I, I'm happy to to attempt to work with Eric to draft up something that will go that will provide you with different options uh, I'm not sure what that would look like but I can we can talk about it I think we appreciate that yeah. um, so uh, are there other questions from the commissioner commissioner thanks for thanks being here. I appreciate it very much. my pleasure um, I still don't see the commissioner public safety um, so uh, can we uh, hear from Chris Bradley Uh, um, oh, you're, many, you're wearing many hats. I wear many hats. Uh, my name is Chris Bradley. I'm here representing the Vermont State Rifle and Pistol Association. Uh, I'm a registered lobbyist for both the VSRPA and the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs. It was my participation in the VSRPA that allowed me to be, uh, become president of the Federation. Uh, just to, uh, to jump back to the line of questioning you were talking about uh, concerning training, uh, there is a civilian marksmanship program. The VSRPA endorses and, and works with. We run matches under the CMP. Uh, one of the things that I do, I'm an NRA uh, instructor, uh, NRA coach, NRA range safety officer. Um, we provide uh, classes to teach people to shoot competitive shooting uh, under the CMP or and that's based on the US Army small arms firing school that you would take uh, if you went to Camp Perry so in order to shoot at Camp Perry there is a requirement you go through a small, small arms firing school uh, the VSRPA has, a, has taken that program basically made it a day-long course uh, so we teach people to shoot competitively 
So that may be something else you want to consider as, uh, because we provide an affidavit of completion of a course uh, recognized by the Civilian Marksmanship Program. Before you move on, can I just ask a question? Yes, sir. Our Constitution literally says you have the right to bear arms for self-defense. Do you teach a course on self-defense? We do not. We uh, shamelessly try to lure people into competitive high-power shooting, and that's our, our focus. The NRA and many other organizations provide tactical uh, defensive courses, um, uh, but that is outside our purview. We are looking specifically for competitive shooters. But there are courses available for self -defense. Absolutely. Can, if I can, um, the Rick Goff here has said that they offer um, ones particularly for women, and it's been over enrolled every time they've offered it. That would be uh, the, the academy. I'm sorry. The, that would yeah. be the Women on Target program. Yeah. That's another yeah. uh, program that the federation. Uh, in fact, if anybody's uh, looking at the numbers of uh, amount of money that comes into the federation from the NRA, uh, those are grants. Uh, these are not paying salaries or lobbyists. These are grants, and we spent something on the order of fifteen thousand dollars for ammunition, uh, pistols, rifles, uh, and uh, equipment to support women on target. Um, and as you said, Senator, it's it's one of the fastest growing courses. Uh, every time we put one out, there are women signing up for these things. Um, If, if, if I may, and I know uh, my testimony this morning should be limited to just those areas of 55 that changed. Um, may I have some latitude to speak just to the age sure. change for a second? Um, it seems odd to me that uh, a person between 19 and 20 uh, can uh, be threatened, be in danger to the extent where a relief from abuse order could be issued, yet and in that critical time, they may decide to uh, take a prudent action of uh, buying a firearm for defense. And that is now encumbered by waiting until what is likely to be a seasonal hunter safety course can happen, enroll in it, and then be able to purchase a pistol for self-defense, when in fact they may already have that self-defense training already. Uh, this is of grave concern to me. I think we're denying well, I won't belabor the point. I, I think there's a lot of gray areas and, and things that, um, but the fact is that when you have bills that have passed one body and then passed another body, um, it really <coughs> would be rare that you would take something out that was in both versions, just as it would be rare to add something in that wasn't in both versions, but actually that's against the rules, although many times it's been attempted. So, I mean, you couldn't add in, for example, an assault weapons ban during a conference committee report on this bill. Mm -hmm. uh, just the same as it would be difficult to take out the background checks because they were in both versions. Uh, I hope you. that help is helpful. No, I appreciate the rules it. That we live under. I am learning them the hard way. Thank you, Senator. Um, as to my testimony, uh, what has been accomplished with S55? In regard to handling events like Fairhaven and Parkland, we failed to see how any portion of S55 would have prevented these horrific events. As we have repeatedly seen, the majority of perpetrators at these school shootings were determined, and they carefully planned and prepared. While repeated statements were made that sections of S55 were imperfect or would not stop everything, what seemed to sway many was the thought that if, if just one event could be stopped, it would all be worth it. The sad truth, however, is that for someone who is determined and who carefully plans and prepares, which appears to be the modus operandi of these sick perpetrators, not one event will be stopped or even appreciably slowed. We have seen it time and time again. In House testimony, it was stated by several representatives that they were able to vote for S55 because it does not take anything away that Vermonters currently own. As that thought generally appears to be true, i.e. that nothing is being taken away from Vermonters, then what has been accomplished when everyone keeps what they own? That is not to say that I support outright bans or restrictions on rights, but how exactly is anything being stopped when nothing is being taken away? 
in the stated intent by the presenter, at least concerning Section 8, is to gradually reduce the number of magazines held by citizens over time. So while the magazines I own are grandfathered, what happens to my grandchildren or great-grandchildren? Am I able to gift or bequeath what I own to them? Currently, I believe that such things would be prohibited. So while the current generation is protected, future generations will not be. And I cannot tolerate a restriction on my grandchildren's rights any more than I can abide by watching my own rights infringed upon. <coughs> I further ask, what is supposed to be done with the magazine in my estate if they can legally go nowhere? Um, Vermonters will obey the law. Several times across the discussion on the House floor, it was stated that Vermonters are law-abiding and they will voluntarily adhere to laws such as Section 6, 6 and Section 8. I beg to differ. While I fully understand the issue of registration is in, in no way related to S55, I ask the Senate Judiciary Committee for a bit of latitude to briefly touch upon the topic of registration as it pertains to compliance by citizens, as S55 clearly does require voluntary compliance. Uh, Chair Sears, may I have that latitude? I begin with a situation that exists in Connecticut. As you will recall, in December 2012, a sick and deranged 20-year-old perpetrated the horrendous and unconscionable act of gunning down 20 six and seven-year-old students and six adults at Sandy Hook Elementary School. As a reminder, he obtained the rifle he used after killing his own mother by shooting her in the face with a 22 so that he could steal the firearm she legally bought and possessed. In response to that unconscionable act, the Connecticut legislature quickly responded by crafting a law that banned the sale of a number of semi-automatic firearms that were labeled as assault weapons. Connecticut residents who own these types of firearms were allowed to keep what they already owned but to remain within the law, they were required to register these firearms with the state before December 31st, 2013. As of January 1st, 2014, there had been 41,347 registration applications made. Given the relatively low, low number of registrations, the media in Connecticut began to wonder just how many Connecticut citizens actually owned these firearms and had not complied. Because there are no exact numbers, the National Sports Shooting Foundation, which is a trade association for firearms manufacturers, attempted to make an estimate. Using data obtained from numerous surveys, customer purchase information, NICS background check data, and even data from private party transactions, they estimated that there were 350,000 owners of such firearms in Connecticut as of January 1st, 2014. As a quick aside here, because these style of firearms are modern and new in nature, Virtually all of these purchases by Connecticut residents were likely made after passing a background check, meaning that these were honest and law-abiding citizens with no criminal records. Yet, when it came time to register, less than 12% complied, meaning that 88% didn't comply, which meant that over 308,000 law-abiding Connecticut citizens appear to have voluntarily opted to become felons as opposed to remaining legal by registering. Now let's look at a similar situation in New York. In April of 2014, the New York SAFE Act took effect, which required New York residents to register any firearms they owned, which matched the New York's version of what an assault weapons law was. Again, the question quickly arose as to how many people registered their guns, and so the government of New York was asked to give that number. New York refused. In response, New York was hit with a Freedom of Information request. Again, the government in New York refused. Eventually, however, New York was sued to obtain the number, and as a result, they were forced to provide what should have been information freely, freely available to the public. From that lawsuit, we learned that just 23,847 people had registered that had these types of firearms. Again, however, there were no hard numbers as to how many New Yorkers actually owned the firearms that were designated as assault weapons. Using the same approach that has been done with the Connecticut estimate, the NSSF again stepped forward and calculated the total number of owners in New York of these types of firearms at one million. If that estimate is accurate, and I believe it is, then just over 2% of the estimated New Yorkers who bought, were thought to have this style of firearm registered, while 97% didn't, meaning that 976,153 New Yorkers willingly opted to become felons. Again, the vast majority of these people likely had to go through a past background check when they originally purchased these firearms, meaning that these were all likely to be honest and law-abiding citizens with no records. With a stroke of two pens, 
A whole new class of citizen were defined in Connecticut and New York. Specifically, this new class of citizens were virtually all law-abiding. They all had no criminal records, but when it came time to do an act in compliance with a law that they felt was infringement, over 1.3 million Connecticut and New York citizens willingly opted to become felons. I relay all that to underscore that when it comes to constitutional issues, there is a percentage of law-abiding firearms, firearms owners in Vermont that will likely not obey any law that they feel is repugnant to the Constitution. I believe that this is especially true when these Vermonters consider the process that had occurred or didn't occur as S-55 was moved through the House Judiciary and then the House proper with amendment after amendment being proposed to fix issues which should have been caught and resolved with more careful and protracted deliberation. Uh, arbitrary magazine limit. Within the testimony provided to the House, I state that there was never any factual basis uh, presented which conclusively indicated that reducing the size of magazines would have any significant impact on mass shootings as it is, the, it is the Parkland event that seems to have brought us all here, I point out that the Parkland shooter used only 10 round magazines and the potential shooter in Fairhaven apparently intended to use a shotgun, both of which would have complied with Section 8. Uh, issue with constructive possession. Within federal law, there is the concept of constructive possession, meaning that if you have certain parts of a firearm in the same place, you can be convicted of having a completed device even though it's in separate pieces. With the ingenuity of Americans, there are carbines, which are short-barreled rifles uh, rather than full-length rifles, which shoot pistol caliber cartridges such as 9mm. The magazines for some of these carbine, or carbines are completely interchangeable with pistols, and in other cases, pistols themselves can be incorporated um, with a carbine assembly to become carbines. If an individual owns one of these carbines and pistol and legally bought a 15-round magazine for the pistol, but which also fits the rifle, is he in fact possessing a legal or illegal magazine at the same time, solely dependent on which firearm it is inserted into, or, or, or is he otherwise guilty of constructive possession simply because the pistol magazine can be used with a carbine? Uh, Next turn to an informal poll on economic impact. In regards to economic impact, the Federation conducted an informal poll of 58 entities that are listed as manufacturers. Economic impact on Section 8 or the whole bill? Section 8. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, that are listed as manufacturers by the BATFE as residing in Vermont. Each entity was then asked if they were aware of S55, and if so, they were asked two questions. One, do you see any negative impact to your business if S55 were to pass? And if you do foresee negative impact, could you this influence any decision to stay in business or even possibly relocate to another state? Due to limited time constraints, only 22 calls were able to be made. And due to the presentation of the list as presented to me, these were all small businesses. Of those, 11 indicated that S55 would negatively affect their business, with 10 of those also indicating that the passage of S55 would and could influence their ability to stay in business or otherwise have them consider a move out of state. Of the remaining 11, two were out of business and nine could not be reached. While completely informal and completely unscientific, and even with some exemptions being carved out uh, with S55 when uh, S55 was barraged with amendments, the poll indicated that 100% of the respondents indicated negative economic impact. Um, issue with the term transfer in Section 8A. Section 8A refers to the term transfer. When I was giving testimony to House Judiciary, the record will show that I repeatedly asked what the definition of transfer was, as it is, was used in several sections, some now thankfully removed, and in response I was repeatedly told that the definition of transfer was the same as applied to Section 6A7. This past Tuesday, however, and in talking directly to Legislative Council, I was told that because Section 8 does not provide a definition of transfer, the definition used in 6A7 would not apply. Within Section 6, Transfer is defined in A7 as, quote, sale, trade, or gift, 
and I believe that this was done purposefully so as to allow the, and support the concept of loaning or borrowing. In section 8a, the term transfer is used, as is the phrase or receive. The use of these two conditions makes it unclear if loaning or borrowing is legal or not. For example, consider two citizens at a range. Person A has a rifle with a high capacity magazine, both legally owned, and person B would like to shoot that rifle. If person A grants the request, as soon as person B is handed the rifle, he has received the high capacity magazine that was in the firearm. The language of Section 8 is unclear as to whether temporarily handling a gun, handing a gun to a friend with, that has a high capacity magazine inserted is legal or not, or simply the act of person A handing an empty ma high capacity magazine to person B for their, exa uh, their examination is legal. Issue with the word import. In Section 8A, the word import appears but is not defined. It is my understanding that a word or phrase is used in a statute, but it is not specifically defined, then commonly accepted use of the word applies. If we consider Google as our gospel, the word, and you Google the word import, I see the first definition being, quote, bring goods or services into a country from abroad for sale. If I can believe that Google might provide a common definition of the word import, it becomes unclear as to whether or not it's legal for me to go to New Hampshire, buy a case of high cap magazines, and then return to Vermont with them, so long as I have something in writing that indicates that the stated intent will only be used for my personal use and not for sale and therefore not an import. Uh, enforcement is impossible. There is, quite literally, almost no way that law enforcement can enforce Section 8. As I understand, you have heard this already with testimonies by folks with far more stature than I. I will not belabor this, but magazines are not typically serial numbered, and they rarely have a date of manufacture imprinted on them. When law enforcement finds a citizen in possession of a high cap magazine, the chance of being able to prove precisely when that magazine was made, when the possessor actually first took possession of it, or even if it is on loan or borrowed, assuming loaning and borrowing is still legal, it will be virtually impossible. Even if law enforcement stopped every vehicle coming into Vermont and then found a Vermonter with several high cap magazines, how could law enforcement tell if they were just recently purchased or simply being returned to Vermont from whence they originally came? Um, S55 does pre prevent the ownership of firearms. In the House, repeated statements were made that S55 does not stop any firearms from being legally owned. At this time, I can absolutely state that this is not true, and I can think of at least one firearm which is impacted, and that is a shotgun made by Keltec. The Keltec KSG shotgun has two integral tube magazines, one on each side, each holding seven rounds, and I believe that by the current definition, that firearm would be made illegal to own. There are also a number of pistols that come standard with magazines that hold greater than 15 rounds, such as Glocks. And while magazines can be made that hold lesser amounts of rounds for a given pistol, it may well be that a manufacturer like Glock will not create a special magazine just for Vermont, such that certain types of pistols may long, no longer be able to be sold here. Arbitrary magazine limits. When the bill left House Judiciary, 10 rounds was the magic number for both pistols and long guns. After a weekend of work, another arbitrary number was arrived at for pistols with a suggestion of 15. I ask the question, allowance of number of rounds is apparently based on the type of firearm. Does that mean that pistols are less lethal than <laughs> rifles? If I have 15 rounds in a magazine with one additional round in the chamber, why cannot the same be true for a rifle, which was also built to accept high cap magazines? Impact on competitions. I next turn to competitions, which is a topic very dear to me. I do not hunt. I instead like to put little round holes in paper at distance, as I am a high power competitive shooter that has been nationally ranked. While I am the president of the Federation, I am also the past president of the VSRPA, and I currently serve as their secretary treasurer. Across the spring, summer, and fall, the VSRPA runs clinics and matches that attract shooters from Vermont and around New England, and we have even had international participants. 
Three years ago, the Civilian Marksmanship Program, CMP, was searching for a location to have a new regional New England Games event. After looking at sites in Maine, New Hampshire, and New York, Vermont was selected by the CMP due to the existing laws of Vermont, which were seen as being very friendly <laughs> to these competitions, as well as the outstanding facilities that are available uh, at the Camp Ethan Allen training site in Jericho Bolton. Every year surpasses the previous year's participants and match entries, such as the CMP New England Games are now being referred to as the Camp Perry of the East, and last year saw 800 plus match entries. This match is a major fundraiser for the VSRPA, with seven days of matches bringing in shooters from around the country and internationally as well. I cannot overstate the economic impact to the area surrounding Keats by having large numbers of out-of-state competitors coming to Keats to shoot in these events Restaurants, hotels, gas stations, area attractions, and stores all benefit with greater ec economic impact every subsequent year. On the House floor, when the issue of the effect on competitions was raised, the presenter informed the House that out-of-state competitors coming into Vermont with high-capacity magazines, which could be used exclusively for competitive shooting, would be prohibited from doing so as this would be called importing even though these shooters would leave with what they came with and then bring them and leave what they came with. Prior to an 11th hour and 59 minute amendment being crafted that would allow these matches to continue, the House appeared perfectly willing to let these events die. While an amendment was passed to allow these events to continue for this year, the amendment was only allowed because it contained a sunset provision which will have it expire July 18, 2019. So when does this get fixed? Or is it the intent to curtail out-of-state out involvement in Vermont matches? While I'm being by no means a lawyer, is there not a legal challenge here under the 14th Amendment uh, under equal protection when Vermonters are given preferential treatment as to what they can, they can do with legally owned property by an arbitrary date versus what an out-of-state citizen can do? With Vermont stopping, stepping firmly onto the anti-grun ground with un completely unenforceable law that makes the state look inane. Events such as CMP New England travel games may well be moved to a state which is friendlier to Second Amendment rights and other statewide events would likewise be negatively impacted. I conclude with bump stocks. Concerning the ban on bump stocks, I am confident that the federal government will prohibit these devices in, the same fa in some fashion in the very near term and they will make it a felony to break that law if it were to be broken. Against that, I see the House intends to get tough on the horrible problem by making the possession a misdemeanor. I also comment that while bump stocks uh, make the act of bump firing easier, it is a known fact that you can bump fire virtually any semi-automatic firearm with specific handling, or you can use a rubber band or your belt loop to accomplish the same thing. Thank you. Any questions? Well, a number, but I, I'll try to be just a few. And actually, I met with somebody on Monday who showed me he can use the, he didn't wear a belt, so he can use the loops on his belt in order to take and have the same as a bump stock. So um, that was your last point. Um, we've heard testimony in here that from the Attorney General, the state Congress, and I've had several emails. <coughs> Unfortunately, Sheriff Boynack isn't going to be with us today because he's home sick, but uh, as law enforcement expressing uh, their opposition to the Sheriff's Association, expressing their opposition. But I've also heard from uh, uh, a number of law enforcement people <coughs> that they won't enforce this law. So if nobody's going to enforce it, what's the big deal? That, I guess that's a devil's advocate question for you. Um, we're not. We're going to have a law on the books, but nobody's going to enforce it. Um, and that's the testimony that we've heard. And I, anybody on the committee is welcome to challenge that as testimony. I would be interested in seeing any active law enforcement officer who put in writing that they will not enforce a law if confronted with a violation. Well, we have a I would be happy to, to uh, try to find those emails. 
I, it should be part of the record if an active law enforcement officer sworn to uphold the well, laws of this maybe state has indicated that he or she would maybe not. Has. That whether you like the law or not is a different yep. issue, whether you think it's easy to enforce. But if confronted, let's say with a, uh, a sale, let's say, take just as an assumption, let's say this became law tomorrow, and a, a licensed dealer sold a high capacity magazine after the effective the okay. They were talking if, about but, but if they're saying they will not enforce the law, that's an amazing statement, and I think it should be in the formal record. Well, I'm going to ask Peggy to find those. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if I could at least respond, Senator Ash. Yeah. Um, yeah. While not specific to Vermont, there are certainly sheriffs in municipalities that have made that clear statement in New York that when it comes to uh, the SAFE Act, they will simply not enforce the law. They have more important things to do. But, but they are Vermont. That's not Vermont, but it's also a different. There are different, it's a nuanced question, right? There's, uh, if indeed. confronted with a clear violation, would you enforce it? And then there's the, are we gonna go out looking and trying to find people in violation, which is different, so. I agree. We make those kinds of discretionary I, I, yeah. enforcement choices all the time, but that's a different I, issue. I'm saying if confronted, I would not enforce it. I okay. appreciate that, yeah. it, it, it becomes, as I've stated, it becomes, from my extensive experience, magazines are not serial numbers. Magazines have no identifying marks. They are simply metal with a spring and a follower. Um, I, I do not understand or see how law enforcement is going to come and see that I have a, a high capacity magazine and in any way be able to prove when I bought it, when it was manufactured, uh, or if indeed, or what, is loaning and borrowing a ma magazine allowed? Uh, I, well, I think one of the questions that we have for Eric, it, um, and, and, and we'll ask later what the interpretation of these are. I have a couple of other questions. Yes, sir. If I could. Um, it's been, I mean, what is the use of a high capacity magazine? Um, uh, evidently, the only legitimate use is contest. Um, well, not at all. In, in terms of sport shooting um, or just recreational shooting, um, uh, having a higher capacity magazine is, is more allows you to put more shots on a target. Uh, as far as uh, competitive shooting, uh, there are different types of uh, uh, courses of fire in competitive shooting, uh, one being a slow fire course, one being a rapid fire course. So in CMP and NRA competitions, there's a concept of rapid fire. Um, which basically means you have two magazines, typically loaded, you're going to shoot ten shots. One magazine will have two in it, one magazine will have eight. Uh, the magazine uh, becomes much easier to handle, having something that extends downwards. So you're actually given 60 or 70 seconds to put two shots, do a magazine change, and do another eight shots within a 60 or 70. So w competitive shooters actually practice fast magazine changes because it's, it's, it's a time issue. Um, additionally, Senator, if I, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, when one is shooting offhand, which is the act of standing and shooting at a target, in my case at 200 yards, um, there are various ways you're going to support your rifle. Um, and different statures require you're going to put your hand in different places on the rifle. It is not uncommon to put your hand so that it's on the bottom of the rifle for a short statured person to bring the rifle up so that you can get a clear line of sight without moving your head. Could you tell me what a, an attached tubular device designed to accept and capable of operating only with a 22 caliber rim fire ammunition? I learned how to hunt and shoot my father with a 22 rifle. I never saw a tubular device attached to that and I have no idea what it is. Um, a uh, tube fed mag exempting that, and I have no idea what they're exempting. Um, I think that's strictly because tube fed magazines on a, a 22, given the small length of the bullet, can typically exceed 10 rounds very easily. Um, picture a, your barrel of the gun, and right under it is a tube with a spring on the end of it. I can turn the end of a, a follower, pull that out, drop bullets into that tube magazine come back down, lock it, it is now under spring tension, so that in either in a pump uh, mechanism or even a semi-automatic mechanism, self-loading, um, it will self-load. Uh, so it's okay to exempt that? 
Um, that's been a carve out in <coughs> numerous states. Apparently, 22s are, are not, uh, even though it's the same diameter uh, as the cartridge of a AR-15. I had the 22 rifle. I remember my father saying Bobby Kennedy was killed with a 22. Um, I'm not sure. I, I know as far as uh, the favored weapon of the Mossad assassinations are 22s. Um, Senator Benning. This is quite simple. Uh, there are millions of these devices on the street today. That's correct. And if an aggressor against me has one of those, and I'm limited by the law to a 10 round magazine, what good is the argument of self defense in the Constitution? One has to imagine what is going through somebody's mind in a self defense situation. And clearly, you're under a lot of heightened tension and pressure. Nerves are going to uh, be running high. Um, it is likely, and we've even seen with law enforcement, the number of times that law enforcement has engaged a target, and this is no condemnation of law enforcement, but multiple rounds are shot that are only several are actually hitting or impacting the target. Uh, I think that's a, a common, you're, you're on edge, you're, you're in fear of your life, uh, quite frankly, uh, in a self-defensive situation, you don't know how many attackers may be engaging you. Um, and in fact, you may not be able to respond by putting t bullets where you would like them to go. Uh, more is better in these cases. During this discussion, I've often been accused by some folks of saying, well, you're not entitled to a bazooka. Correct me if I'm wrong, are bazookas actually a common device on the streets of America? Uh, they are not, but there is the concept under BATFE of any other weapons. <coughs> I know of cannons in Vermont, legally owned, uh, everything from 20 millimeters. I know a gentleman that, that is a class three dealer that has these collections, all operable guns. And oddly, oddly enough, um, machine guns, if we're not aware, are, are legal in the state of Vermont. I can't recall any crime being committed in Vermont with a legally owned machine gun. Nor can I find one with a bump stock, for that matter. But, uh, or a cannon. Uh, or a cannon, or a bazooka, or grenades, or uh, yes, it's, there are classes of firearms that are completely allowed for people, honest citizens, who can pass background checks and be fingerprinted and get a, a, a chief law enforcement sign off and be FBI background checked to own these sort of weapons. Do you have a neighbor who has a cannon and it's never allowed? That may be a black powder cannon. And well, it's, it's right across the river in New Hampshire, so ah. I don't know what they, but it is really loud. They're trying to keep you out of New Hampshire. Oh, <laughs> exactly. uh, I went to a barbecue in Tennessee and they had a cannon in the backyard. <coughs> Majority leaders in Tennessee sent shot the cannon for us. With a celebration, I guess. Well, our, our neighbors get shot. Cannons in Tennessee, and they're okay. Um, other questions? Thanks so much. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. The question about the arbitrary, as you say, arbitrary 10 or 15 um, for the magazines. Others would argue that the manufacturers, if a number of this does mirror, at least it roughly mirrors what a number of other states have done in terms of magazines and capacity. Mm -hmm. There are some who would argue that manufacturers, that there's a logic to it because then manufacturers have a consistent audience of what's, uh, or, or consumer base for what is allowed to be bought and sold in those states. What, what's your reaction to that? Um, well, certainly. Uh, uh, I'm not saying in favor, but that's the, it's an argument which seems to have some logic to it. So I'm wondering what, what the. Uh, I guess uh, I'm, I'm not certain that it's advisable to pick up laws uh, from other states and feel that they apply to Vermont. Yeah, I'm not asking you to make that statement, nor would I make that statement. Okay. What I'm saying is from the, the issue of uh, rendering some uh, firearms no longer uh, effectively able to be used mm -hmm. because currently the 
conventional magazine size would not uh, uh, be compatible if there are <coughs> millions and millions and millions of people living in states that all have a similar restriction one might think that the manufacturer, <coughs> rather than having a custom made for Vermont, a custom made for New York, and a custom made for this state and that state, if there was consistency in the magazine capacity, that there's a block of consumers all with one treatment. I'm just wondering if you think there's a logic to that. Uh, I'm, I won't gainsay that there isn't logic to that. I mean, certainly uniformity is, is something that may be desirable, but uh, that stifles, in some case, cases, uh, creativity and the ingenuity that has allowed many uh, advancements uh, in technology and, and certainly with firearms, um, such as the, the shotgun I mentioned. Um, I, when it comes to defense, it, it, I don't think it, we can quite put ourselves in that situation uh, to what you're going to be feeling if, in fact, you have to defend your family uh, against one or more people. It is, as difficult as that may be for some of us to imagine happening here in Vermont or anywhere, but these things do happen. And uh, you don't know if you're going against one attacker or two attackers or however many attackers. Um, and in a defensive situation, um, I think things are running high. Um, and what logical, when, when someone is coming at me and I can repeatedly apparently see uh, evil people using magazines to, or, or high capacity magazines to attack completely innocent people. What is the rationale for limiting my ability to respond in kind when I'm a law abiding citizen? Other questions? Chris, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Are you handing in testimony? I'm sorry? Are you handing in It's in our foot. I believe it's our foot. Thank this was handed to me. I just wanted to pass it down to this uh, input for yeah, we'll one of the people in the audience. Okay. Okay. What? Okay. All right. I'm getting. I wanted to have Commissioner Anderson. That's our next witness. And this is testimony from uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Well known. I've been here a few times. I've been here. Known him well over the years. Um, thank you. <coughs> Commissioner, we're not going to put you through that. Process of going over the whole bill as much as we want to. Um, no. I'm concerned about two floor amendments. One on page 14 that requires the Department of Health and Safety to develop, promote, and execute a collection process that permits persons to voluntarily and anonymously <coughs> bump fire stops. I don't know if you knew that was there. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, I have not. Um, I don't know. The one portion of this. You before they assign new no, I mean, the one portion of this bill that is most uh, most important to, to me at this point, the, other, the, the issues with respect to the, the uh, uh, background checks, the bump stocks, the magazines, those are really issues that I'm not prepared to testify on or provide information well, on. I, I haven't really reviewed the bill that closely. If your department has any concern with the requirement. The, on subsection C on page 14, I would, I would request one, if this bill passes, uh, there will be one addition to that. The Department of Public Safety shall develop, promote, and execute a, collect, a collection and destruction process. And destruction. That would be my only request because if this passes, they will be illegal, and uh, it doesn't help me just to collect them. I need, to, I need, then I need the ability. Then we got another storage problem. And then I got another storage problem to the extent we get any, but uh, I would just. is a report on background checks on private firearms. Um, on before December 15th, Department of Public Safety, the Executive Director, Chiefs of Police will submit to the House and Senate Committees on Judiciary a review of current pra practices, additional options, all that. Um, I hate, I mean, these are floor amendments, so obviously you were never consulted before giving a new duty. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not that I lack for reports that I have to provide. Um, uh, so I do have a yearly report on reports, by the way. I wish I, I wish I could give you better testimony. I just I don't know what all that would entail. You know how time consuming it would be. Well, I, I don't uh, want to get into a situation like we had with the, um, the, the secretary of education. I keep calling him the commissioner, where 
she refused to do a report <coughs> mandated by the legislature. She said she didn't have the resources. So I'd prefer to ask the commissioners or secretaries if they're able to do the report. And it seems like a pretty detailed report. It, 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 could, it could be. I just haven't had a time to look at it and talk, you know, talk to um, it would probably you know the colonel on you know what exactly that would entail. Well, if you, um, if I can you do that and submit something to you. To Eric tomorrow morning sure. With any recommendations. No problem. There. Um, the one part of the bill that is cr critically important to uh, I, I think the way S55 started was the my ability to get rid of firearms. So that 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 component of the bill is uh, extremely important. There really is no there really is no good way right now for the state to dispose of firearms that have come in its possession that they cannot be lawfully possessed by anybody. They're either illegal per se or they're unlawful as defined by statute uh, or the bigger chunk of them, the guns that are abandoned um, that I've got uh, in our possession that we have real no no good way to get uh, disposed of. So that, that's really the correct. So I know it's the boring part of the bill, but it's uh, it's no, it's the sweet spot. It's, it's, it's <laughs> the only sponsor of that. I know it's not the I know it's the boring part of the bill, but it's critically important. Which contact me, you know, uh, really vehemently against the bill, asking why I sponsored the bill. <laughs> what it grew to be was not no, it's, something that I envisioned. It's, it's a former shell of its an original. Uh, <laughs> it but is, it's still but, there. But it's still there. That's. I will yeah. say this, if, if I might. I agree that this is a tremendously important provision that has been left out of most discussions. But unless we do this and give you the ability to dispose of these firearms, yeah, yeah I don't. I don't think there's problem. anything terribly controversial in it. It's. Uh, I don't I, think, I think anyone it, opposed to it. So it could appear somewhere else right. on what happens to this. But we're at sort of critical mass on that at, at this point. That I've got to. I think there's general agreement on this committee that at least that. Anything else? No. I, uh, Any uh, other questions, Senator Ash? Um, I'm just, I know that the administration had been uh, at least part of helping craft some of the amendments that came forward um, before third reading of the bill, maybe even second reading, but that's all beyond my knowledge. Um, was anyone from the administration at all involved in writing the report in Section 10 or the provision? On page 14, about the, where you requested the destruction be added. I, I don't believe I, so. I, just, I, I don't. You know, I don't. I, I, I had no discuss. I, I have not had any discussions on that. It seemed like a fairly minor, uh, more of a technical correction right. to the bill. To if they're going to be illegal, I've got they've they've got to be but it's, it's collected and gotten rid knowing of. Knowing that there were floor amendments and not all floor amendments are equal. Some yeah. come from the committee. Some come from people who support the bill. Some from people who oppose. Sometimes it's the administration. In this case, the list of 11 or whatever that were on the. House floor came from all sorts of so we're just trying to get a sense of whether anyone in the, the first I heard of it, the, no no the first I had heard about it was I think when it was getting voiced on the floor and I think I'd made a request to try to get it sneak it in at that point but I'm not I'm not it may have been too far along at, at that point it just seemed like a technical uh, omission uh, in the in the amendment the term so. usually is so. drive by <laughs> Former prosecutor, do you see any enforceability problems with Section 8? Uh, uh, Senator, I really have not looked at it that closely to tell you. That's the um, the <coughs> magazine the magazine part of it. I, I really haven't looked at that closely to, to make a determination of whether there'd be enforceability. You know, I mean, there's always enforceability issues with every law. So, you know, I, I, I just can't give you a good answer on that right now. But I guess I'm, I, not on enforceability. There's a provision in this bill that allows a manufacturer to continue to manufacture something that's outlawed in the state of Vermont. That um, seems kind of incongruity and incongruity to me that you would say, okay, this thing is so dangerous that we're going to outlaw the magazines. Do you know of any other where in state law or even federal law where we allow something that is so dangerous that we ban it to be manufactured. I not off the top of my head. It's that's one I'd have to take a I'd have to take a harder look at. So I, I find that to be one of the most yeah. egregious, speaking personally, uh, things in the bill. That if you really believe by 
that this item is so dangerous, the high capacity magazines are so dangerous that they should be banned in the state of Vermont, that you would then go out and provide an exemption for them to be manufactured. Okay. And I suppose it will be difference of opinion, but I find that to be interesting. I, I did two actually until I talked to somebody and they are still, this bans them from civilian use and they are still sold. The manufacturer, I believe it's in St. Albans, manufactures them for law enforcement and for uh, military purposes and for lots of other purposes other than civilian use. So it isn't it's incongruous as I originally thought it was. But. So that's the explanation I was given. Senator, did the administration support that proposed change? I, I can't answer that, Senator. I don't. Uh, the change of, of the. Do, uh, have yeah, I, again, I have not. I, the shorthand look, the exemption uh, for the manufacturer of these. I have not reviewed the bill, that section of the bill closely. I've not discussed it with the administration as to what the position is on that. So I'm just unable to provide the testimony you're asking for right now. So if there were an amendment to allow the manufacturer just for military and law enforcement purposes. Well, I, I mean, I suppose they can sell it to Minnesota. Am I safe in assuming from a previous remark that you were never asked to appear before the House to provide any testimony on this? I, I provided testimony only on that section of S55 that, or whatever it was in, in the House, on S55 related to the, to the ability to dispose of firearms section. section, section. section. That's, really, these are, these are very political questions. Uh, I, you know, I think law enforcement um, should be, mostly stay out of it. So. Other questions? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> We have a, a letter from um, Sheriff Poignac that all the committee has seen. I don't think it's necessary to call him. He's home ill. Um, the Vermont Sheriff's Association is opposed to um, other than banning bomb stocks. And uh, background checks are okay. Current background checks work in trying to enforce the private sale would be nearly impossible. Enforcing the high capacity magazine ban would be impossible. Uh, we understand that we need to protect our school children from fixing the domestic violence. We strongly feel that this bill will not protect anyone. That's from the Vermont Sheriff's Association. TJ um, Dunham would like to talk to us by phone. So could you uh, I think later for him, we could try him. He said 9.50 or right at 10, but we could try him. Well, 9.50 is... Yeah, it's 9.50. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Close enough for government.
myself and others were raising issues of enforceability about how we would enforce such a law. Uh, but reflecting on that experience, uh, I think what came out of that was a couple things. Number one, training is always required on law enforcement, police and prosecutors. But more importantly, public education, uh, public awareness, and trust of Vermonters uh, is what happens as a result of these debates and these bills becoming law. And I think in that case, we've driven down, no pun intended, the instances of sexual law driving that have saved people's lives. That's a good thing. And on this uh, specific uh, bill at 55, uh, enforceability, I think, is going to be clear cut in some instances. Uh, for instance, the retail sale uh, provision, uh, that's going to be clear. Uh, when a gun is used in the commission of a crime, uh, and it, it could be a secondary effect, uh, I think that's clear. I think the issue that was raised was in reference to the grandfather clause, and I think through collaboration, I think through training, I think through public awareness and education among Vermonters, uh, we will be able to enforce uh, this law. Uh, I, I am pleased and I agree that the legislation does not require any sort of registration. I would not support that. Uh, but I want to be clear, I support S55 as it was passed by the House. Uh, and I think we can do our job uh, as we have been trained to do uh, should this uh, bill become law, which I do support uh, it, it, it becoming law. And I want to be clear about the testimony of my colleague yesterday. He did exactly what he was asked to do. He's a lawyer, he issued spots, he raised, he raised issues. Um, this process is, is a, a process that has been uh, difficult uh, because this is a, a a unique time, I think, in our country and in our state dealing with this issue. We want this to be the best process possible. Uh, we, want, uh, we want a law uh, that is fair to everybody. And I think it is something I think S55 has passed by houses. Uh, does that, I support it. And I want to thank you, Senator Sears, for your leadership on this issue, uh, for your willingness to engage in this debate. And uh, I just want to say thank you. We will. So the headline of the Bennington Banner this morning is AP's Office Magazine Limit and Gun Bill Largely Unenforceable. Uh, I didn't see the Banner headline. I saw another headline that was very similar. And I think, you know, that stems from the, the testimony yesterday, which again went directly to uh, the, the grandfather clause, if, if we call it. And I think the enforceability of that comes down to public awareness and public edu education and trusting Vermonters. That's what we do in this state. We trust Vermonters. And if a case arises, uh, will we be able to investigate it? Yes. Uh, but let's do like we've done in so many other cases, particularly the texting while driving, which I remember, I raised issues of enforcement. Uh, this is about educating law enforcement, police prosecutors, uh, this is about educating the public, and that's the best way to enforce the law and enhance and maintain a public safety. Any other questions? Uh, you, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're hands free right now as you're <laughs> driving around the state. Um, any other questions for TJ? No. Anything else, TJ? All right, Mr. Attorney General. I, I just want to. I, I just want to thank the Senate. Uh, Judiciary Committee and Senator Sears, uh, again, for your leadership on this issue and your, your willingness to engage in, in this debate. Uh, I know it's not easy, uh, uh, and this is, a, a, this is a law that I think in the past will save people's lives. I think we can be fair to all the large, protect due process, protect people's uh, uh, property rights, and at the end of the day, uh, ensure that everybody is safe and protected in this state, and I think S55 does that. So thank you again for your leadership. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I did. Um, my plan right now is we, we still have one witness scheduled and uh, haven't gotten to him. So I'm going to push our 1030 bill back to some other day, which we pushed back several times and then come back here at 1030. But I do want to make a statement. Um, which I think is important to recognize. Today, 
in the Senate, we're going to vote on H-422, which is an important bill on domestic violence and will protect many Vermonters who suffer from that. It came out of this committee on a 5-0 vote. Today in the House, they'll be voting on S-221. I believe it came out of the House Judiciary Committee by 11-0. These bills will do more to protect Vermonters than anything that's, in my opinion, uh, in this bill. However, shortly, we'll also, my hope is that we have time to do H-675, which will provide protection, particularly in our schools, um, and it will be geared towards our schools. So while we have sharp differences on S-55 and what's been passed by the House and Senate in this committee, I want to just emphasize where there's tremendous agreement on at least two and hopefully three bills that will help really protect the monitors. So, I think it's important that we battle over S55 to keep in mind the positives that are happening in the state. Thank you. So we'll be back at 10:30. Hear from Bill Moore and then discuss where to go from here. Um, Senator Sears. Yes. Well, I'm going to introduce Senator Sears. Senator Sears, Senator Sears. 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 Bill Moore of the Vermont Traditions Coalition will be the final witness on this bill. Um, and then we'll have a little committee discussion with Eric. And then we'll go to H799 and actually notice the sale of property subject to unpaid property taxes. Very important bill. Absolutely. Must be. I encourage you to spend more time on those bills. I wish I could. I would much prefer that. Well, so I think we we know who you are, but not going to say what I'm going to say. Just inadvertently push the term on here. I there it is. Uh, Bill Moore, on behalf of the Vermont Traditions Coalition, we represent land based sporting interests, land based business interests of all type around the state, basically, the culture of Vermont's economy and recreation sports. I'm also representing the Green Mountain Boys Shooting Club from the inner Vermont for purposes of, specifically for purposes of Section 8 today. Um, I wanted to uh, try to answer two things that came up earlier before I start. Um, what is a bit of a hodgepodge, I apologize, I didn't want to repeat. Um, people like Chris Bradley who do such a good job. Um, there was a question yesterday regarding semi-automatic pistols. Henry um, Perro indicates to me that of his pistol sales, 80 to 85% are semi-automatic of the type, almost exclusively, uh, have 12 round or higher magazines. The few that have 10 are usually the antique uh, 1911 pistols from the 60s and 70s. So I hope that's helpful. Um, Someone would come and be using some things. Absolutely. Uh, particularly in Cary, um, I am, as you know, a strong proponent of safe, lawful carry, whether it's concealed or open. Uh, I often carry open in my own home. And I get nothing but comments, never been harassed for that. So, uh, yes, absolutely. Both in the home and outside the home. Uh, I know a lot of folks who carry in the woods. So I want to back up. Um, I want to start by saying that the best exemption this committee can consider on S55 is to exempt it from Section 8. And you won't have to worry about exemptions. The second thing on that note is that the viability of a bump stock ban is now in question because the federal government is clearly engaging in a process that will either result in some sort of ban, but certainly at the very limited 
regulating them much as the machine gun is regulated now. Limited supply, highly restrictive background process, registration, and so on. I won't bore you with the details there. So I think the committee would also be safe in removing that. <clears throat> to just focus briefly on history before we get to specifics on the bill. In 2014, there was a bill, some underlying bill, S31. And among other things, it did include a gun check system. And the turnout was overwhelmingly opposed to that. Uh, it's been stated by certain House leaders that a public hearing was held on this bill. S55, which by the way, its original title was different. Um, S55 is introduced, was titled Subject Criminal Procedure Jurisdiction Statement of Purpose. The bill is introduced as it proposes to expand Vermont's territorial jurisdiction over prohibited and regulated drug sales. No changes occurred in the bill until February 28th, or the week of February 28th, 2018. It had been introduced on January 31st of 2017. Once the work was underway, it was already six to eight weeks after the January 30th hearing, which is being <coughs> propagated as an excuse for not holding a public hearing on the current version of S55. We still demand public hearing S55, but we won't impose that on this process because we feel we may be close to some sort of resolution. I wanted to remind the committee that the process has been fraught with such errors and restrictions on the House side. I do not feel that way about the treatment that the bills have here in the Senate. I appreciate the time today and the extended testimony by uh, up to this point. We still oppose the entire bill, speaking on both of the groups that I'm representing, um, except for the underlying solution to our overloaded storage problems in our law enforcement. And I have since spoken to my sheriff uh, to reinforce his support for that particular section. I believe there are deep issues with several pieces of the bill that will be under litigation shortly after its passage, if it passes now. <coughs> not the least of which would be age 21, appears to contradict Vermont's Constitution even more so than the federal Constitution. And I would refer to the, the uh, Common Benefits Clause, which was in the uh, Baker decision, if I'm not mistaken. I get rid the Baker transpose sometimes, and I apologize for that. The, the, the problem with the essential problem with the Section 8 ban, although we get to keep our magazines, is that it's equal to being able to keep my bicycle, but no longer selling tires and tubes. At some point, they wear out. At some point, I cannot import more. At some point, I cannot patch them. I have broken magazines at home that I keep for parts. I believe many people in the room have had that experience. Not everyone, like some of us, own a dozen mags for one gun. Some only have the original two. Those can quickly, those can quickly break, and you are left uh, as a misdemeanor violator in order to re resupply yourself. Um, let me take a segue to refer to the Attorney General's recent statement. Um, I believe his deputy spoke very accurately with regards to the law with regards to the evidentiary standards needed to prosecute. And I think he spoke very clearly to Senator Ash's um, scenario, his hypothetical. Um, but I would add um, to that, when she was here, um, no retailer in his right mind will have a magazine hanging on a rack on October 2nd. Uh, they will be gone long before that. I would also direct to the Attorney General's comments Senator Sears, that uh, we don't enforce tailgating. I've not seen a, I've not seen a prosecution for tailgating in recent memory. I often wish they would. It's one of my pet peeves. But 
but I would suggest an alternative amendment to address the Attorney General's concerns. We should have primary enforcement for texting while shooting a gun. You cannot equate texting or driving with the individual right to possess arms for the defense of yourself in the state. It simply can't be done. Not in statute or constitutional understanding of the history of the right. It cannot be done. Driving is considered a privilege. We license it for reasons other than the fact that it's a right that can be limited if they have to do with safety. And as I point out, tailgating is quite illegal and very difficult to prosecute. But it does remain to be illegal. In the case of an accident, it becomes an issue in the information from the police officer. It then becomes an issue for the state's attorney to consider prosecuting as would be the case if someone were caught and there was some evidence that they had a bump stock illegally or they had a magazine illegally, it would become part of the information from the police and it would be up to the state's attorney whether to prosecute. You get to the deputy attorney general's statements, I believe you'll find very, very little energy to do so. Now I'd like to speak directly to um, my club. I, 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 I brought in Henry Carroll several times. He was in the House Judiciary Committee, spoke eloquently with him. I uh, believe that his comments had a great deal to do, along with Ed Cutler and others, with the dropping of the assault weapon ban for the bill. Um, we're glad we're effective there. Um, but my club has, uh, like Chris Bradley's organization, uh, unique characteristics by which this bill would impact. We have 400 members currently, give or take, uh, excuse me, many of them from out of state. We have a British national who's on the UN delegation in New York that comes up. We have people from Toronto and we have people from Montreal who come down and come to the shoots from all over New England and the Eastern Seaboard. Um, some of our events are the primary event is competitive and an exhibition as well. But we have those members wishing to come at their leisure and use the range, so they will they will drop their membership. Our event, the main event, uh, in the weekend in July, which we talked about in House Judiciary, has 1,500 to 2,000 people involved over the course of one weekend in Memorial County. Most of those are spectators who pay a fee to come and spectate. That's a major fundraising tool. We also have a big pig roast that I recommend it on Friday night. <laughs> but ours is unique in one respect. Um, we have a large contingent of military entities, including World War I tanks, which are legally owned under some provisions. Um, we have, I have never seen a bazooka, but I, there may be somebody who can legally own them, I don't know. Uh, recoilless rifles, lots of belt fed antiques from World War II, World War I, Korean War, and lots of handheld rifle type uh, weapons, all of which utilize either belt feeding or large capacity magazine or devices of other types. Essentially, this would, even with the grandfather, we would be hard pressed to reschedule that event come this July knowing full well that this law will prohibit that the following July, and 80% of our sign-ups are done the day of the event for the following year. Much like you might book a favorite week at a vacation spot. Senator? I'm just commenting that we have the ability to have deleting that section to allow putting in some setting 
feel it's the least well prepared, least fed, and I think judging by the, the, the journal of the House for the last two periods when it was debated, it's clear there are unanswered questions, amendments that were not fully fleshed out. Um, personally sat through one amendment that, that passed, but there were three other ideas in that room in that conversation in 15 minutes that led to that amendment merely because it was the only version of it that would get enough folks to walk out of the House Judiciary Committee with no testimony, technical testimony on that. So to wrap it up, that's, that's really what I want to say um, is, you know, it, it really needs to be removed and live to have a discussion another day with more time, expert testimony, and this is not the time or place to do that. Um, could I uh, leave a personal note, hopefully a humorous one for Senator Ash? <laughs> I went to Wikipedia the word cabal, and I, I think that subcat would, would fit my group too, and it was meant clearly as a little bit of hyperbole, and I hope you took it in that spirit. I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you bringing it up, but it was just just for the committee's benefit. This was mentioned in a CAX story, but not in a humorous way. And I think that no matter which side people are on this issue, one of the challenges is, for instance, I've never met Michael Bloomberg. He did grow up in Massachusetts. In that regard, I guess I'm a flatlander like he would be. If he lived here. But I've never met him. But there's a perception that he's controlling the actions of some people in this building. The perception that people are getting bust from other states and that that's influencing the outcome of the events is a perception that gets fed, just like there are perceptions on the other side, which are not accurate. And in this case, uh, there has been a steady drumbeat this year of claims that Chittenden County is somehow immune from economic pressures, from people in poverty, from a variety of social and economic and other pressures. And it has been a steady drumbeat. And this was just one example, hearing that it's a Chittenden County cabal that is somehow behind the emphasis on gun legislation uh, this year, when the irony of it all is, is that the administration itself put out a memo that was even more expansive than what's on the table. So I do appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, but for many people who watch that, they get a different read, because they know that you're in the building, you're being interviewed as someone with a more of a first eyes, or a, a, a first hand experience. And they might think that, in fact, it is a series of Chittenden County legislators or community members who are solely driving this uh, issue. That, that would not be accurate, which I think you would agree with. Well, if you check our record, you'll find I've never represented anything regarding outside of mine, so I was referring to the votes, and I appreciate your response. Senator Begg, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Top of page 10, um, your receptions in the 18 and 20 page group that in the event they have passed a certain course might be able to still purchase if they can show that they have completed said course. You represent two organizations in the production of the second one you was. Got a Green Mountain Boys Shooting Club in Eden, Vermont. Is there any training program that you do that actually provides a certificate of completion? Not formally, but we've spoken about doing it in the past. We have to be happy to. Okay. Um, are you aware of any other courses anywhere that would provide a certificate of completion for someone who is strictly trying to learn for self-defense purposes. I'm not. I believe Chris Bradley would have a better handle on that, but I might suggest that the Vermont State Police Academy could formulate some sort of uh, training cadre that would be available to come to clubs like ours and provide that. I would think it would be a one-day event. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric. I don't think we'll make a decision today, but of what to recommend is uh, you could recommend that the Senate concur with the House proposals in November. We could recommend that we hold a committee of conference, or we could recommend that we concur with further proposals in November. But a number of amendments suggested that seem to be a little either technical or common sense. Um, you know, yes, we should give the commissioner the ability to destroy something that he's got uh, <coughs> handling a bunch of home stocks. I don't know how large they are. If they're illegal, we should destroy them. Uh, Yeah, if I believe that 
want me to yeah. let you know at least what I thought were more technical in nature. Yeah. So the one you just mentioned, Senator Sears, about allowing the commissioner to destroy the weapons of their tools or return to them. There's the other one about that I believe Commissioner Porter is going to be back in this afternoon, which is uh, providing some, uh, in terms of the age restriction, to permit Right now, it's phrased so that it's uh, people taking on a safety course of their equipment. I think they're going to come up with some thoughts as to uh, a firearm safety course that might sponsor that and propose some language. So there's that. There's the, uh, the other two that I have are one was a clarification that the definition of who, who the family members are who are exempt from the background check to clarify the in laws so that we could put some language in there so that uh, any, like something like any of the both relations by marriage or something like that that would cover the laws. Um, and the other kind of one that I had was the... Let me ask you one question about in-laws, Joe. Would it be possible they still your in-laws? I was thinking the same thing about my stiff great grandchild. Um, what exactly would that do? I don't know what it is. I just, I just, I just, I just, not, I just, I don't know what. I got a divorce from everybody. Is my former father-in-law still my father-in-law? I guess we're going to have an interpretation somewhere down the road. We're going to have a If you can 
concur with the proposal of amendment and voted for everything else. I am that a striking section A said we voted for the background checks, you voted for the 21, you voted for the bump stock, you voted for the original bill. Just so people in the audience are aware of that. myself 
torn between do I vote on trying to fix that and the understanding that the votes coming out of the Senate for the passage of this bill and in all likelihood will remain in favor of passage of this bill? Or do I continue to vote no and be kept out of trying to make the changes? And that's, that's a very difficult position to be in. For whatever it's worth, I've lost a lot of sleep and I don't know where I'm going yet. It should be said that all of us have been put into an extremely awkward position. <coughs> it just has not been fun and I'm sure no matter what decisions we make going forward, we'll all be continually <coughs> eviscerated by various folks along the way. I agree totally with you, Joe. Um, I've been saying I, at the time that we were forced to vote on certain unions in this committee, Senator Nitka was on the House Judiciary Committee. We knew where we were going. Uh, we had upset a lot of constituents, but we knew where we were going and which side we were going to be on. This one is much more difficult. And, uh, there are parts of this bill that I think are, are good. And I can even find myself seeing some good come out of a background check. That's what makes it more difficult, I think. And uh, you know, I I took my lumps over several unions and had the cat calls when I was in the Battle Day Parade and other things. But you know, that's what happens. That's what you get paid the big bucks for. Did I miss that paycheck? <laughs> no, that's just for chairs. Just for chairs. I'm not just it's, it's, it's sort of a system like when you're no, for the record, we get six hundred and fifty something dollars a week while we're in session to do this. And the house gets the same amount as we do. Certain unfairness to that. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed my friends from the House Judiciary Committee are in the room. Yeah, sure. I, I do think that it's unfortunate that what has happened here is that we've kind of been put in. Um, two camps. You're either for or you're against. And there's a whole uh, <coughs> gradation along there. And, and then we haven't. Um, so I suspect that no matter what we do, we will, from people on the far end of here and the far end of here, who don't understand the process, that we'll get we've gone too far or we haven't gone far enough. And that, that there are, that, that, that I, and I, I um, <coughs> I'm sorry that we have, I regret that we have been put in two camps. And I saw it um, at a, an event in Putney on Saturday, and I live in Putney, and we, we tend to be over here. Um, but I, I saw it. I saw it there, and it was very unfortunate. And I'm sorry that this has happened, because I think there is a lot of middle ground where we all agree. Yep. So, just on one little piece here. Um, this is something I raised before on page eight, number two, license dealer. This is with regard to a private to private. Transfer whereby you're getting a belt check. So, top of page eight. Uh, a license dealer who shall return via the proposed transfer or and decline to continue facilitating transfer. Um, in fact, this might be going against the federal check law because this says the dealer shall return the buyer and propose transfer. In fact, as I said, private to private comes in. The dealer checks the person who's the purchaser and he fails. The dealer then cannot return the gun to the person who wanted to sell it without the dealer putting them through a background check. Did you so, check that out? Yeah, I've talked to all kinds of people about it. And I think that you know, this is in conflict perhaps with. I thought that's uh, why they put the language in about being, not being offensive. I'll tell you a chance to go there. The bankers never say that that was for sales tax. That's right. Sales tax. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Yes. So uh, I, I have to look into that a little bit more. Yeah. That, that's a, uh, I don't know if there's something I can draft around, which is. But, uh, 
we flip that question around. If in fact that the seller is illegally holding the weapon, does this language require the dealer to give the weapon back? You mean if he hasn't gone through the next check, background check? You mean if the seller is prohibited for a reason? The seller, the vendor, the dealer recognizes that this individual is a convicted felon. But he's brought in the weapon to sell. Does this language require the dealer to use the weapon back? Uh, I don't know. That's an interesting question. There is a shout, but there also is language that says they have to comply with all the requirements of state and federal law. So it's an interesting question. Well, I, I guess you do that. You know, you ask a different question in a different way. Under 2.1 if firearms are seized, the person could give them to a friend and say, sell them. Um, and so the friend sells them to somebody else, but he's not the owner, but is doing it. Can, uh, what happens there? The owner is actually illegal to possess. Senator, I, I have a Detailed answer if you want. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. <laughs> on, uh, for the record, Vermont, uh, Vermont Traditions Coalition, Bill Moore, um, under their license requiring them to follow all state and federal laws, if they were made aware that a person was before them who was prohibited in possession, they would have to report that to the police. If they were merely flagged yellow, which is a delay, they could tell the person to come back in three days and they would follow the law as to what the final dispensation was. My question has to do with friend, a friend is arrested and cited for domestic violence and firearms and seized under 422 at the scene. Those firearms, the friend says, hey, I don't want them, I don't, I don't, you know, I want to get out of this, I want to be back with my girlfriend, wife, whatever. I, I just want to get rid of the gun, show her that I'm serious gives them to a friend, the friend goes and sells them, but it's not the owner. And a private sale, but is it interesting? I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting questions there, Alice, that you've raised, but... Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I was addressing Alice's... Yeah, you can, but I want to get to the other bill. Yeah, I, I just want to ask, Bill. Other legislation, not bill. Yeah. And when you when you said that if they become aware that it's a person that isn't, but are they required? I go in with him. He has to have the check because he's going to receive the gun. Are they required to do a check on me, or is it just if they become aware that I'm? not allowed, that I'm on the list. Uh, yeah. Are they required to do the check of me also before they allow me to take it back out of the store? They, they would be now. Uh, uh, under like five, six years of directive from ATF, they would be required to do so, yes. Even though I haven't ever even let them touch it, it's never left my hands? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know the serial number. Yeah. I've got enough guns. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I, I hope that this has been as educational for you as it has been for me. And thank all the people who testified. I, I suspect that there are a lot of people who didn't get to testify who would like to. And there are those who will say that the testimony was one sided. Um, I'm happy to hear from anyone with written testimony between now and tomorrow morning.